Hello. Um, thank you, Boris, for the introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here on a beautiful snowy morning in Munich. And uh, I'm very honored to be asked to make the first presentation here at this amazing conference. So I am Mark Porter. That's my Twitter name. If anybody wants to follow me, new followers always welcome. I have a studio in the UK called Mark Porter Associates, and you can see some of our work at uh, that URL. And the hashtag today, if you want to tweet, is QVED2016. So I've been in the editorial design business a long time, long enough for my hair to go gray. And for the first half of my career, if you were an editorial designer, it probably meant that you designed magazines, maybe newspapers or books. Life was very simple in those days and straightforward, but then things started to change. I still consider myself an editorial designer, but nowadays, as well as designing, um, whoops, as well as designing magazines and newspapers and books, we design digital products for the web, native apps, identities, and in recent years, we've also got involved in television design. So everything changed about halfway through my career, and I was launched into a world where I had to adapt and learn a lot of new things. The pace of change has only accelerated, and in the future, I think we can only anticipate more change. So I'm going to talk a bit about where I started, some of the things that I learned along the way, and also some of the things that have changed that I've had to adapt to, but also the things that haven't changed. And there are still some fu fundamentals that I learned at the beginning of my career, which I still use in everything that I do. So um, I started off in print. About halfway through my uh, career, digital came on the horizon. That was a big shock and a big learning curve. And recently, we've got involved in broadcast. And I'm going to talk a bit about each of those things and then bring it all together at the end. But I'm going to start with print. Print is probably what most of us have in common. Uh, we still love print. Print is still the heart of what we do and the heart of our thinking. And this conference is, is very much about the future. It's about where editorial design is going. But I'd like to start by looking at just a couple of uh, important projects from my past, because they're projects that really define for me what editorial design is, what the scope of it is, and what the inherent nature of it is. So the first one is this magazine called Colors, which I worked on over 20 years ago now. I see that's the uh, winter 1994 edition. Uh, it was a magazine published by Benetton. It still exists in a different form. And the strap line was a magazine about the rest of the world. It's a magazine about global culture. And the editor at that time was this amazing guy, Tibor Kalman, who sadly died of cancer in 1999. Tibor was a, a remarkable character, a brilliant, inspiring, crazy genius. And he was fond of saying things like this. Why do designers think that they have better ideas about what things should look like than ordinary human beings? Now. Um, when Tibor said things like that, it was really a provocation because Tibor believed in design just as much as anybody else did. A good designer is an expert, and experts are important. But I think the point he was trying to make was that we should respect our audience, and we shouldn't design from an elitist perspective. And through my career, I've seen a lot of design, which I think has been done by designers for designers. But I always try and bear this in mind. We're designing for our audience. The audience is who we're working for. Uh, and we should make what we're doing accessible and usable and enjoyable to the audience. So Colors, being published 20 years ago, was a magazine that existed before the internet. It's probably hard for a lot of people in this room to imagine a world without the internet. But we were making this magazine before there was Instagram, before there was YouTube. If you wanted to see what the world was like, you had to go there or you had to find it in a magazine or on television. So the heart of every issue of Colors was a photo essay on a particular subject. This particular issue was about shopping. 
And this photo essay is just about shopping all over the world. And in those days, the pictures were all physical pictures. They were slides, transparencies. We used to get about 10,000 pictures in for every issue, edit them, and do a photo essay like this. And these, this kind of searching research for amazing pictures from all over the world was one of the pillars of colors. The other pillar was a different kind of research. We would research physical objects from all over the world, too. We had a big research department. This is from an issue about sport, and we had correspondents all over the world sending us balls that were used in various sports. So this one on the left-hand page is a football that was lovingly handmade by a child in Senegal because they couldn't afford a real football. And we would gather these objects together, photograph them, always in this hard, white background style, almost forensic photography, to try and just make them feel like objects. It, it's almost as if you could reach out and touch it. And that combination of picture research and photo essays and object research and still life photography was the, the sort of design core of colors. But the, the remarkable thing about colors was that it, it was put together differently from almost any other magazine that I've ever worked on. Normally, the editors commission the stories and then the art directors get involved and read the stories and try and visualize them. But in colors, the visuals always came first. So if you ignore my colleagues in the middle there and look behind them, every issue started with a series of rough sketches of what the stories were going to look like, which went up on the wall in the editorial office. So in the top left-hand corner there, you can see the original sketch for that ball story. And then the researchers would go into action, gather all the props. We'd take them out and photograph them. And then I would do a more detailed sketch of what the page was going to look like. And then eventually, when we had the real photos, we would pull it all together and create the spreads. So available pictures edited and used in the most dramatic way possible, combined with objects research from all over the world, this was an issue on travel, and these are crushed Coke cans from every continent in the world. So the remarkable thing about colors was it was pure art direction. There were no templates at all for this magazine, apart from the cover, where the logo and the strap line was always in the same position. Every other page in the magazine was recreated issue by issue, from a sketch and then from gathering pictures and putting the layouts together. But Colors did have a very strong visual identity, but the identity came from editing and curation and art direction. And that's one extreme of editorial design, imagining visual stories, telling stories visually, and putting them on a page. I'm going to talk very briefly about The Guardian because that represents another extreme, a very different way of doing editorial design, which is also uh, very important to us, and we do a lot of this. The Guardian redesign was a complete reimagining of the newspaper, a format change, a design change, a, a relaunch that questioned everything about the paper that existed before. Audio? Has changed. That was a TV ad which ran uh, at the time of the launch. And this was about something very different from Colors. It wasn't about art direction at all, because the art direction happens every day in reaction to the news. So this project was about creating a structure, creating a set of tools for people to use that could adapt to any set of conditions. So we had to create uh, a design that could cope with a very boring, straightforward news day, 
and also that could cope with a very dramatic and shocking event. We were creating spaces for visual journalism, spaces for photography, and the center spread of the newspaper every day is one incredible news image, or maybe some information graphics. And we tried to create a kind of toolbox that people could use to combine photography, graphics, and text to tell the stories of what was happening in the news that day. It was a very uh, successful project, which was imitated all over the world. That paper on the right is from Israel. Uh, there's been a lot of things like that. I find them very flattering, really, and quite entertaining. And the amazing thing is that 10 years later, apart from a couple of little tweaks, the design is still being used pretty much in the form in which we invented it. But this type of editorial design is about systems and structures. So we created a grid system which lies behind everything that gets done in The Guardian. Every element that appears on the page connects to that grid system so that even if 20 or 30 different people are doing layouts every day, there's a kind of continuity and a coherence to the design. It's about creating a typographic system. We worked with Paul Barnes and Christian Schwartz of Commercial Type on a new set of typefaces. We ended up with over 200 fonts in the end, and a color system. So in the end, we created a, a kind of set of materials for people to use, and a visual identity. You know, The Guardian has a very strong visual identity, but it's not something that where we were really able to be the art directors. For the first couple of months after the relaunch, I actually sat on the news desk and did the front page and did some of the layouts myself. But the idea with this kind of project is to create a system which allows other people to be the art directors every day. So those are really the two polarities, I think, of editorial design. Pure art direction and creating systems and templates and visual identities. We still do a lot of print work. It comes and goes. We're actually working on two very exciting print projects at the moment, uh, a weekly magazine in Paris, which will launch in two or three weeks. I'd love to show you, but I'm afraid I can't. And one of Europe's oldest newspapers, which is published in Copenhagen. And we still do magazine and newspaper design, but most of it, because we're consultants, is more like The Guardian. It's about creating identities and systems for people. So, for example, this is a magazine which we made for Svenska Dagbladet in Stockholm, a culture magazine, which is very much about celebrating the written word and beautiful photography. So we made a very cool, spacious design, very monochromatic, lots of black and white photography. They had this beautiful typeface called Forsberg, which was made for them in the 1960s, which is based on stone carving, chiseled lettering. And we loved that. We made that a kind of important element in this design. But in the end, again, every day, it's about their team finding the images and doing the layout. We can only give them a set of tools to work with. So when I'd been a, a print designer for about 10 years, and after I'd finished that Guardian redesign, digital had been becoming important. It started off as something that people did kind of in another room somewhere. But after redesigning the Guardian newspaper, I had to engage with it because the next project was to redesign the Guardian website. So this was the design which we launched, I think, in about 2007. And in fact, it just bedded down in time for the, the US elections in 2008 when Obama got elected. It looks a little dated now, but at the time, this was pretty state of the art. This was about as much as you could do on the internet in those days. And this project was uh, enjoyed all over the world as well. That's a website from China, which uh, took some cues from what we were doing. And as soon as that was done, of course, the iPhone was launched. So we found ourselves creating native apps for iPhone. And then the iPad came along, and we created an iPad app. This was actually the first project I did in my own studio after I left The Guardian. And it became clear that the pace of change was just getting faster and faster and that new environments were being created in which publishers had to uh, produce content. And it was really becoming clear to me, digital is different. It's a completely different world from print, and it's different in many ways. I mean, if you think about it, print is really a pretty antiquated 
industrial revolution type of technology. It's about big machines in big factories using up a lot of materials. Anyone who's ever been to a printing factory knows that they're noisy, dirty places with bales of paper and ink and hot metal things everywhere. But when the paper goes through the press and the ink is put on it, something magical happens. The content and the form which we create for it are fused together and can never be separated. And that's an amazing thing, really, because it gives us incredible control over how the, con the content is presented. And there are various things, I think, that which are important about how print differs from digital. One of them is permanence. If you come to our studio, you'll find hundreds of magazines from the 1960s, which is where we steal all our ideas from. And um, some of these are 50 years old, and yet they still exist in their original form. And I can absolutely guarantee that the digital work we're doing today will not exist in 50 years' time. Print also gives us complete control over scale. This was uh, the Guardian Weekend magazine, which I used to be the art director of, and it was a large format tabloid magazine. So it, it gave us the opportunity to do something like use a picture of a face and a hand bigger than life size, which you know, has an incredibly dramatic effect. And we can do that in print because we know what size the image is going to appear. Print also gives us precise control over the elements on the page. Uh, I could have chosen any example here, but this is one of my favorite magazine spreads ever, uh, done by Dave King in the Sunday Times magazine in 1977. And what makes this amazing is the relationship between the elements, the scale between the pictures, the fact that you know, the curve of his chin goes up and leads you up to the corner of the left-hand picture. It's all about the size and position of the elements and how they interact with each other. And we have precise control over that in print, but we simply don't in digital. And last of all, printed products are physical objects. They have a weight and a smell. They're made of atoms. They're something you can pick up and hold and carry around with you. And that, again, is very different from digital. We always interact with digital on a screen, and what we create for digital exists in the same environment as everything else that's out there. We can't pick up the Guardian website and take it with us. And you know, digital is deceptive because when we look at something like this, it's very easy to think of it as a page. And in fact, we call it a page. We call it a web page. But it's not a page. It's actually a computer program. That's what this page looks like. It's several hundred lines of computer code, which gets sent over a wire to your machine. And only when it lands in your browser is it rendered into something that looks like this. And that creates a lot of problems for the designer, because we don't know what devices people are looking at these pages on. Uh, it could be a laptop, it could be a phone, it could be anything in between. So that means that we have to approach our design in a very different way. This is the, the current Guardian website, which took over from my design. And this is a demo of something that's probably very familiar to you, this idea of responsive design, which a few years ago seemed incredibly new and shocking and now we're completely used to. Uh, but what it means is that when we design a product for the web, we have to make something which can adapt to any screen size because we can't predict what kind of screen size people are going to view it on. Increasingly, we can predict what the majority of people are going to be viewing it on because mobile is becoming very dominant for our clients. There's a, a thinker and blogger in Silicon Valley called Benedict Evans who wrote a blog post last autumn which said, mobile is not a subset of the internet, it is the internet. And that's increasingly the experience for most of our clients. They have probably 60, 70% of their audience on mobile, but we still have to design for the other 30% who might be looking at it on a laptop. And then we also have to think about the people who are looking at it on a television set or a watch or in their car. So we have to design things which can exist in an incredible range of environments, which can appear on a very wide range of screens. And that means that unlike designing a magazine or even a newspaper, we don't just have to design it once, we have to design it 10 times, 20 times. We have to imagine it in, in a wide range of different forms. Now, it's not impossible to create digital products which behave like traditional magazines and have art direction. 
This is a magazine which we created for a charity in the UK called Nesta, which exists to promote innovation, and we tried to create an, a very innovative product, a, di a digital magazine which was made using an HTML-based publishing system. So in theory, this is a publishing system with a WYSIWYG interface, which ought to allow us to make pages in the same way that we do in InDesign. And we did our best, and we really pushed this system to its limits. And we did some pretty cool stuff, which does look and feel like a magazine. But in reality, the tools we were working with weren't quite sophisticated enough. And we did end up, in many cases, having to Photoshop in the headlines into the pictures and so on, because the HTML publishing system simply wasn't precise and flexible enough to allow us to make a digital product that really had the same kind of precision as a print product. But we tried our best, and we, we really pushed the boundaries on that one. But in most cases, when we create digital products, it's much more like what we did at The Guardian, and in fact, even more extreme than that. We're really just creating a set of containers for people to put content into. This is a preview of a, a new project, which again will be coming out in the next few weeks. It's a new new site which is based in Barcelona, in Catalonia, northern Spain. We've done this as a collaboration with Pablo Martín from Atlas, a uh, brilliant Spanish studio. And this product was created by a bunch of people who came from the newspaper industry, from La Vanguardia, which is one of uh, Spain's sort of upmarket quality papers. They wanted to create a new newspaper, but of course, this being 2016, when you create a new newspaper, you don't do it in print, you do it on the web. But we tried to make something which had a very strong visual identity that didn't look like a newspaper at all, something that felt very digital, and this, this grid system and the use of photography and, and color is an attempt to give it a very distinctive personality of its own. But of course, because 60%, 70% of the audience is on, is on mobile, actually this is a more realistic way of showing what the site is going to be like. But when you create an editorial project now, it goes far beyond just designing a website or designing a magazine or a newspaper. Everybody has to have a strong visual identity. So the core of El Nacional is that grid system, and the branding is all based around these yellow squares, which get used in lots of different contexts. You can see it on the home page there, and also it's part of the, the page design. It gets used in social media. It's even being used in their building for signage. And of course, they don't have any trucks. I wish they did have trucks. But every time you do an identity for somebody, you have to put a truck in there, just, <laughs> just in case they get one one day. So it will work on a truck if they ever decide to buy some. But it's more and more important that people have a visual identity beyond the site or the magazine these days, because people who are publishing digitally are more and more publishing outside their own domain. Uh, a lot of the publishing now, and particularly in the future, is going to be happening on platforms like Facebook, Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News, Snapchat Discover. We're looking at a world in which the people who create content are losing control over where it gets distributed. If you want it to be in front of the audience, you have to be engaging with the audience when they're already on their phone, communicating with their friends, using things like Facebook and Snapchat. And if you're going to exist in that environment, along with everybody else, you really need a strong visual identity so that people recognize that it's you. And social media has also completely changed the way that newspapers and magazines behave. It used to be that when you made a cover on a magazine, all you had to think about was how it looked on the newsstand and what the readers thought of it. But nowadays, a magazine cover is a big event on social media. Every time a magazine like Vanity Fair publishes a new cover, it goes out on Twitter. Uh, this got 1,500 retweets, almost 2,000 likes. It gets discussed on blogs. And magazine covers have a, a life way beyond the printed product now in social media and beyond. Another of the big changes in digital is availability of real-time metrics. This is a site called Chartbeat, and all our clients use something a bit like this. It tells you exactly 
what users are doing at any moment, how many people are on your site, what they're looking at, how long they're spending there. You can tell exactly what's popular, what's not popular, what time of day is the best time to publish something. And this really influences the products that we create in a digital environment. For example, this is a magazine we work with in Rome, Italy, called Internazionale. It's a weekly news magazine which we designed a few years ago. And actually this has its imitators too, rather amusingly. That's the newspaper of a, a hospital in Rome. And the design of Internazionale was very much about typographic detail. It's very structured, it's kind of a New Yorker-y, economist -y sort of feel, very sort of simple design, but the typographic detailing is very crucial. So we tried to bring that degree of typographic detailing into the web product too. And they launched with this homepage, uh, which was not a kind of hierarchical, typical news homepage. It's just basically a feed of stories. And the idea was that the newest story always goes to the top and pushes down all the other stories. But it turned out from looking at things like Chartbeat that nobody was reading these stories. But the one thing that was really popular was just this, which they used to do once a day, a roundup of the top news headlines from all over the world. This got a lot of traffic. But of course, when new content came in, that just got pushed away. So they actually redesigned the homepage and made the top of the homepage a new element based around that idea. It still has all the other material underneath it, but now that roundup is at the top because we were able to tell from the metrics that that's what people really cared about. And once again, of course, I show you the desktop version because it gives us more design opportunities. But in reality, this is how most people are seeing it on their phones. So really, in digital, so many of the rules that we're used to from print get destroyed or reinvented. And we have to think in a much more open way. And something, you know, every day, something strange and interesting happens on the internet. I don't know how many of you know this site. This is quartzqz.com which is one of the, the most interesting news sites on the internet, business news, published by the Atlantic Group. And it has a very strong design on the desktop site, quite a kind of self-conscious, obvious kind of design. But they recently launched an iOS app, which is based on a chat interface. And you know, when you look at it, it doesn't connect to the, the desktop design at all. You wouldn't recognize it as being anything to do with Quartz. There's very little design in it. There's no art direction in it. You just get asked these questions by text. You can respond to them by clicking on an emoticon or asking for a different story. It does take you through to the mobile site, but then it takes you back to this chat interface. And in branding terms, you might say that this has got absolutely no connection with the rest of their design. But because Quartz has a very strong kind of attitude and position, then it does kind of feel like Quartz just because of the, the idea of doing this in the first place and the very intimate relationship with the audience. So some of those rules about being consistent in different environments just don't apply anymore in digital. I don't know whether this is the right thing to do or not. Nobody does. But you have to experiment and try things. And that is something you can do in digital. So. Print and digital, very different things. To me, in print, content is obviously the most important thing, working with content and designing with content. We also think very hard about identity because it's very important for us, particularly as consultants, working with people that we are able to create strong visual identities for them. Interface is not something that we think very much at all about in print, really. If anything, it, it's almost less important than the third thing because people have been reading printed products for 500 years. We kind of know how they work. We know how to turn the page. We know how to find our way around. Obviously, tables of contents, folios, labeling. There is an element of interface in print, but it's really not very significant. But in digital, interface is probably the most important thing that we have to think about. How do people interact with this material? And that Quartz iOS app is a, a great example of that. Identity is extremely important too, as we've seen when your content is going to be off on other people's platforms or flying around social media, you need a very powerful identity. So in digital terms, from the designer's perspective, 
content becomes the last thing we think about because we often don't actually have access to the content. We're just creating a set of containers into which the content can be poured. So digital is a whole other world, really, and every day something new happens in digital that makes us think in a completely different way about what we do. These are just a kind of random selection of headlines from the last week or two, and every one of these things has implications for our business and how we think and behave. So being an editorial designer in the digital world is like being in full-time education again, having to constantly learn new things and change your thinking. And as if that wasn't complicated enough, in the last couple of years, we found ourselves getting involved in broadcast design too. So this was a Dutch TV station called RTL News, who originally came and spoke to us about designing a website for them, which we delivered in the end. But in the meeting about the website design, it became clear that they wanted also to do a rebrand of the TV channels. And uh, of course, I stood up in the meeting and said, you'd be crazy to get different people to do these things. We can do the rebrand too. So they said, okay, what would you do? And then I thought, right, <laughs> I've never done a TV rebrand in my life. And I had to ask myself a couple of fundamental questions. You know, how do you do brand identity design? And initially, I thought the brand identity design was something that Wolf Erlins did or the Pentagram did, you know, something you did for a bank or an oil company. But when I thought about it, I realized that actually all through my career, I've been doing brand identity design. This is a newspaper we did in Lisbon, Portugal a few years ago. And as part of that project, we delivered them this logo, which is a very strong visual form and color. And that ended up being used in all sorts of other contexts, which we hadn't anticipated. We didn't design it as a piece of brand design, but it became a piece of brand design. And The Guardian is a, a much more extreme example. We designed a newspaper, which then ended up being rolled out into lots of digital products. The same typography, thinking about space and color, ended up being used in advertising, in environments when The Guardian moved into their new building, and even when The Guardian opened a coffee shop. So although we set out to design a newspaper, we ended up actually doing a brand identity program. And once I realized that, it made me feel much more relaxed about rebranding RTL News. Every editorial project is an identity project. And it took me a while to understand that, but now I believe that very firmly. Because when you design a magazine or a newspaper, you're creating a visual identity for an organization that's based on their personality. And increasingly, it's something that has to exist in a lot of other contexts. The other question I had to ask myself was, how do you do motion design? And that was a bit harder because I'd never done any motion design in the past. So the answer to this one is, you find some people who know how to do it. So this is my friend Dylan Griffith, who uh, I met at the beginning of the RTL News Project, who is a great branding and uh, TV designer, used to work at MTV Europe. He brought in a guy called John Beckers, who's a brilliant After Effects and motion designer. And they were our team, along with my studio, working on the RTL design. But approaching a TV design, we approached it in exactly the same way that we would approach a magazine redesign. We started by looking at their visual history and heritage. So these are the title sequences that they ran over the sort of from the 80s through the 90s to now. And then once we've looked at the client's history, we look at the wider context and look at the competition. So we looked at RTL News alongside things like their main competitor. This is NOS, the, the Dutch state broadcaster. That's what their news looks like. BBC News, which is also available in the Netherlands, and Al Jazeera. And when you look at these things, you may start to notice a theme emerging. <laughs> Uh, they all have these spinning, pulsating world globes. It's, it's amazing how everybody does exactly the same thing. And it reminded me of a brilliant TV show that used to be on the BBC in the UK in the 1990s, which was a pastiche, a comedy pastiche of TV news called The Day Today. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, this is comedy, but it's not actually very different from what a lot of those guys are still doing. And we did a little bit of historical research. It's fascinating where this iconography comes from. And it starts way back 70 years ago in the 1930s. Here is an illustrated summary of the news. It will be followed by the latest film of events and happenings at home and abroad. So this is cinema newsreels from the 1930s already had that rotating globe. And then round about the, the 1950s when TV started to spread, added to that was the idea of the pulsating radio waves. So these two ideas, the, the rotating globe and the radio pulses, are still at the heart of most TV news design. It's amazing. And you know, they date from an age which was very different when the world was like this. If you wanted to know what was going on, you had to watch the television. And everybody was focused on that box in the corner of the room. But nowadays, of course, life is completely different. We're not all focused on the television. We're all using different devices and different media. And if you want to know what's going on in Syria, you're just as likely to go to Instagram as you are to go to TV news. The other thing all those identities have in common is that they all use this kind of shiny, glossy 3D rendering, which is something that came in in the 1980s with this piece of kit, the Quantel paint box which was the first sort of desktop piece of equipment that allowed people to do these shiny metallic 3D animations. And it seems that TV news fell in love with this look in the 1980s and never got over it. So we decided no shiny, glossy, pulsating, rotating globes. So what we did was we looked at how people are really getting the news on TVs, computers, mobile devices. And we thought that what they all have in common is this idea of the rectangular frame. And the frame was a nice metaphor, too, for the news editing process, about focusing on the essentials and stripping out the inessentials. And it all came together one day when I was looking at my iPad, and I realized that the top left-hand corner looked a bit like an R, and that you could take the shape of a TV set or an iPad and rearrange it into the letters of the RTL logo. And that formed the basis of the new identity. But actually getting the material on screen, you know, how do you start designing a TV project? Well, actually, you start designing it the same way that you design a magazine. You make a grid. So this is the grid that we use for RTL News. It's just like a magazine grid, multiple columns with gutters, baseline grids. We built our typographic system around it exactly as we would with a newspaper. Uh, all the type sizes are set, the widths are set, and these elements get superimposed on the live action like this. So typographically, it's very much a magazine kind of sensibility that we're using, but we're applying it to television. Information graphics became very important as well. That's another area in which I think most television design looks very dated. The information graphics are over complex and over design. So we tried to bring in a graphic uh, aesthetic that's much more in tune with the kind of work that we're used to doing in print. Simple maps and diagrams, strong colors. And we did the weather as well, which was great fun, designing all the weather maps. Again, trying to use this very stripped down graphic style. So when you look at all of this stuff together on screen, you see some of it is what they call full program. It's taking over the whole image. But also some of it is going on these big screens in the studio. And the studio design was another thing which we had to think about. And obviously, that's a long way from designing a magazine or a newspaper. We had no experience of that. But we worked with a, a studio from Belgium called Pierce Monte on this set design, which was based around our idea of the frames. Initially, we did 3D models to test all the camera angles and stuff, because this is an expensive business, building a TV studio out of real materials. So you have to get it right. And then we actually built a physical studio so I really felt like I, I'd come a long way from being a magazine art director when we were responsible for building a studio set like this. But in the end, it's about graphics, images, communication. But these big screens 
are great, but you have to put something on them. They always need content, and there's not always a story to put on them. So we also created these ambient backplates, and when we haven't got other images to show or graphics, these go on those big screens and just kind of bubble away. And these are enormous files, these animations. They took three days in the render farm to create. Okay. Okay, my presentation doesn't seem to want to move on to the next slide. And the next thing we had to think about was the title sequences. Find a way of introducing TV news without those spinning pulsating globes. There is a narrative here where we're talking about, we're trying to imagine information coming to the user. So we start on a global level, we zoom in to country level, that's the Netherlands. Then we zoom into city level and we actually created a 3D model of a sort of average hypothetical Dutch city, sampling parts of, the Nether of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and so on, composing them into this imaginary city. And then we zoom into street level, and then we zoom into block level, and the idea is that each of these particles is like an individual waiting and interacting and gathering information. And of course, TV news happens at lots of different times of day, so we had to create a series of different animations. The first one was for the morning news with a sunrise, and we had a beautiful one for the late night. <laughs> came together in a complete rebrand. And I have to just show you this, continuing the theme of copies. Uh, after this came out, a TV station in Malaysia came out with this. So they, they copied everything, even the desk was copied. Um, but what was, you know, what was really interesting about doing that project was that I'd come from a sort of print and digital background. I was working with some people who'd done broadcast design before, and between us, we managed to create something really new. And I'd just like to show you a short sequence from a project we did in the US, which actually never happened because of a, a corporate restructure. The CEO who commissioned us left. So this never came out on TV. It was for a business channel in the US. But it's another example of how bringing a kind of print mentality to information graphics on TV can create something very new. Now, if you go back to 2011, basically the S&B pegged the franc to the euro to stop the currency from moving too high. And here you see the currency just kind of bumping along here, not really doing too much. The central bank would wind up printing francs, buying euros, all to keep this peg a 0.82 euros uh, versus the franc. Then, boom. Out of nowhere, disaster strikes, no warning, nothing. All of a sudden, the S&B removes that peg. Swiss franc shoots up over 30%. People, traders rushing into the currency. A lot of guys caught short. And there were immediate repercussions all across the currency market. Within minutes, the franc was higher than every single major currency in the world. Now, granted, there's always a winner every day, but to this spread was pretty enormous. And there were six standouts here that I really want to check out. The first is the U.S. dollar was actually down 17% uh, on the day. You had the British pound off by 18%, even the ruble uh, off by over 18%. Crazy move here? Maybe not, and here's why. Central banks have a lot of foreign reserves, about 8 to 60% of GDP, but the Swiss central bank trumped that 
with over 90% because it had to buy so many euros to keep that peg. And it was getting a lot worse as the dollar appreciated and the ECB pumped money into the system with QE. The Swiss bank had to buy even more currency that was quickly uh, losing a lot of value. Okay. And if you really want to see where the pain hurts the most, you have to look at Swiss watchmakers. The majority of their watches are actually exported by how much? a lot. And exports were already waning as global economies really limped along and those watches are actually going to get a lot more expensive. And stocks like Swatch Group as well as Richmond, they got hit so hard yesterday, down double digits in just hours. And the Swatch Group CEO kind of said it best when he said, you know what, this is a tsunami. It's a tsunami for the export industry, for tourism, and for the entire country. Huge day with repercussions to come for months and months and months. We got a lot more for you. We're headed towards the opening bell. We're going to have a check on the futures as well as your top stories. So what's interesting about those is that we created the original graphics exactly as we would for a magazine. And in fact, the, the guy on my team who worked on those graphics is pretty much a dedicated print designer. And then we worked with the animators to bring them to life. So it shows that actually to do something really powerful in motion graphics doesn't require a different kind of brain and a different kind of thinking. So print, digital, and broadcast, they're the three parts of what we do. We've had to learn a lot of new stuff we've had to learn to adapt, to open our minds and approach things in a very different way. But what's really interesting now is that these things have just come closer and closer together. So RTL News, our TV client, of course, also has a website. And the website has video on it, but it's basically mainly text articles. So you go to the RTL website and it behaves in exactly the same way as a magazine or a newspaper website would or our clients Internazionale, who started off as a print magazine and then created a website, also do a lot of video now. So we had to create some motion branding for them to use in their, their video operations. So whether you're working in print and, and thinking in a print world, or whether you're working in digital or in broadcast, some of those things bring very new challenges that mean you have to have an open mind and think in a completely different way. But increasingly, they're coming closer and closer together. And certainly in our business, and I believe business for most editorial designers these days, it's not enough to just be able to produce a printed product. You have to be able to adapt to all these environments in order to, to function and exist as an editorial designer in the future. But if that sounds scary, the good news is that even though there's a lot of new technical stuff to learn, particularly with digital, and you have to be prepared to, to rethink what you do every day, the heart of what we do has never changed and it's always the same. It's always about content. You know, without good content, you can't make editorial design. And the best editorial design is a response to the content and a conception of visual storytelling as a result of the content. It's always about identity, whether you're making a magazine, a newspaper, a website, a Twitter feed, or a TV station. Creating strong visual identities for editorial is extremely important. And it's also about interface. That's much more important in the digital world than it is in the print world, but it's still part of what we do. So these are the things which my studio really focuses on. But we also try not to forget about aesthetics. If we have time, we try to make things beautiful as well. Thank you.